Uh, welcome back, everybody, from holidays. Uh, my name's Torsten Bell. I'm the director of the Resolution Foundation. There, in lots of ways, I know the ending of holidays is difficult. Okay, so this will have been a difficult few days. I want you to see tonight, though, as another holiday. Okay, now it's a holiday because it's a break from total political chaos. Take, <laughs> taking this is happening about ten meters over. Uh, that direction. I've no idea what's going on. I do not want updates during this. It's going to bring. This is a break, and it must not be interrupted. The, uh, it is a break from what you normally get when you come to events in the Resolution Foundation, which is purely on the the economics of data and theory. We're not going to do a lot of economic concepts today, and instead we're going to do the economics of stories. The, now we're not really into fiction at the Resolution Foundation, so. Um, I'm not going to start, but what we are going to talk about today is this book called Narrative Economics, subtitle, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events. The, um, we're going to focus on uh, that, and we're very glad that we're not only doing the book, but its author, Robert Schiller, is here to tell us a bit about it, and he's going to have to tell us about it because you can't have read it yet because it isn't really out there. Uh, when did you say you saw the first copy? Yesterday. 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 Okay, fine. And so, it's not out on Kindle yet either. So. Okay, but, okay. but you can buy it upstairs in paper. There. I'm sure you're all going to do that uh, afterwards. Now, I should do proper introductions, even though lots of you know him. So, Professor Robert um, Schiller from Yale is an author and a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's worked on lots of things, but probably best known for work on financial markets and volatility, there, but behavioral economics and lots of other things. And I'd say one of the defining features for people that have followed your work for you know, 20, 30 years is you're a single man defying of the idea that economists never look at other disciplines work. There's lots of other disciplines in this book, but also in previous books you've written, and that is, given that the stereotype has become particularly strong, that nobody in economics would ever look at anything a sociologist did. I mean, we wouldn't here, but you do, and that's good. The, um, that's good. So, we're gonna, so um, Robert's going to tell us about the book for about 15 minutes, then Darshini David, who is responsible for narrative economics in lots of ways, because she's an economist and author, but also a BBC economics correspondent. Those of you that wake up early-ish, but the Today programme, we'll hear her telling you about narrative economics on the Today programme. The, um, most mornings, I'm sorry, it's a bad lifestyle choice, but it's, we've all made it's them. It's a terrible lifestyle, it's not good for holidays. It's not good for holidays at all. And then we're going to have time for some discussion. So that is what we're planning to do. But to kick us off and tell us about the brand new book, over to you, Robert. Well, uh, you asked me, when did I get started on this topic? And I think I actually got started when I was a teenager and taking an economics course, thinking that maybe uh, the description of major events I've heard of is incomplete by economists. Uh, and I had a professor as an undergraduate assign me a book uh, called Only Yesterday, written in 1931 by Frederick Lewis Allen about the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression that followed. And I read that book and I thought, you know, I'm getting more insights, maybe, <laughs> from, the, from the history book than from, uh, than from uh, the Keynesian models that we were studying. Actually, I like those models, but uh, over the years, I've, be I've become interested in uh, what is it that drives the modern economy what, into fluctuations, ups and downs. The, the uh, presumption among many economists is that, well, it's exhaustion of resources, it's technological progress, it's mistakes made by governments, <laughs> depending on their, their outlook on these things, or the central banks sometimes doing it right and sometimes making mistakes. But I, I have a sense that that wasn't all that's driving. And there's something else happening uh, that we're not capturing in economics. So you mentioned it's about stories. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of what motivates me. Criminologists like to understand how criminals think. So one thing they do is they go to a jail or prison and interview the prisoners. And you ask a prisoner uh, who's in there for 20 years, <laughs> say, you ask, what's your philosophy of life? <laughs> you don't get a response. Instead, you say, that other prisoner over there, what's he in for? And then you get a long story. They all know what, what happened. And, and there's moral judgments that come up uh, in the story. And there's perceptions of what's rea rea real and important that you see by listening to the story. So that's the thought that preceded... Uh, well, I had another book in 2000 called Irrational Exuberance. 
Uh, and uh, before that, I've been attacking the um, efficient market story that markets are driven only by new information. They appear random, that's because new information is always a surprise uh, and the markets are just reacting. It just didn't sound right to me, uh, although I like mathematical economics. It seems to me uh, it was overdone and there's some truth to that. Markets are hard to predict. but. Uh, so, uh, when I was elected president of the American Economic Association, I gave my presidential address called Narrative Economic. It was a couple of years ago. Uh, and I took it right to my profession that I think that we're missing. The, maybe the more, in, in big crises, the more important driving force, and it's some kind of stories that go viral. Uh, stories uh, that encourage optimism or pessimism or moral judgments. Uh, People are moral creatures and sometimes they boycott things or they refuse to participate because they're angry. Stories have these emotional dimensions. Uh, I, I've been interested in confidence index. In fact, I've created my own confidence indexes for the stock market. Uh, but I don't know that I think these are enough. Uh, economists recognize that sometimes business people are confident and sometimes they're not. And you can poll them and ask them. But the polling is uh, kind of unidimensional and maybe it doesn't capture what is motivating changes in behavior. Um, so I, 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 this book identifies the study in this book as an adventure in consilience. I've been reading more widely than most, you, you refer to... Define consilience for us. Consilience was a term coined by a Cambridge uh, Trinity College uh, professor, William Hewell in the first half of the 19th century. And it means the unity of knowledge. He wrote arguing that successful scholars are people who listen to other disciplines. Later, E. O. Wilson, the bi biologist who became famous for studying ant societies <laughs> and seeing parallels to human societies, uh, he wrote a book called Consilience. Uh, it does seem to me that you can, uh, academia, which uh, causes people to identify with one department in the university and have obligations there and nowhere else, uh, they lose perspective. Uh, so one perspective I got is from the medical school. And that explains the cover. If you look at the cover, it shows uh, a graph uh, of a epidemic curve, stylized there, the upper one. That's uh, epidemiologists who study diseases will tell you that an epidemic is not forever. Usually it goes up and then it goes down in a hump-shaped epidemic curve. The reason for that is, uh, well, there's, it's a complicated field. But part of the story of the epidemic curve is that diseases are contagious and people recover. The contagion rate has to be higher than the recovery rate for an epidemic to get started. If it isn't, then it'll just fizzle right at the beginning. And the contagion rate and the, epi and the recovery rate vary through time depending on circumstances or mutations in the... Influenza is a disease that keeps repeating, but it isn't exactly the same virus each time. It's a mutated form that, that overcomes our immunity. So I, I was thinking that economic stories are like viruses. We should be studying them and we should be cataloging them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> economists don't, haven't been doing that. But now with the advent of, of uh, digitized uh, text, we can search and it's starting to happen. I'm thinking that the economics profession will be going through a revolution similar to the Keynesian revolution that started in the 1930s. That time, in the, when Keynes wrote the general theory of employment, interest, and money, uh, the data was just becoming available for gross domestic product, or they called it gross national product then, uh, and unemployment rates, and uh, inflation rates, and stock price indices were kind of a new toy for most people. So you tended to build models relating those variables. But we've moved to an era where you have so much more information and we have the computers to process it that I think that we are going to have a different sort of economic. I wanted to write a book anticipating this. So one theme of the book is that 
stories are like diseases. They, they come and go, but they, they kind of hang on after they've disappeared. And then there'll be a mutation and they'll come back. Same thing with economic narratives. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, they need, uh, for example, there is the narrative about machines re replacing jobs. You remember the Luddites? That was here in Britain in 1811. They had a big protest. In fact, they destroyed machines, uh, complaining that their jobs were being destroyed by these, replaced by these machines. Uh, and there have been other outbursts like that at times over history. Uh, in the Great Depression, uh, the, uh, I, can, I can document that the attention to the, uh, these robot stories uh, was ex suddenly extremely high. And people thought then that the Great Depression was caused, uh, I have a quote from Albert Einstein who said, Albert Einstein firmly believed that the Great Depression was caused by technical progress that replaced jobs. They said, we're living in the power age. They didn't say computer age. We're living in the power age where big machines with tremendous horsepower are doing all the work. And puny little people are just lost in the... But that faded. You know, these things come and go. And I think they lie in the wings now. We have an artificial intelligence narrative that is somehow not quite gripping people. But it could if there were where to start a recession. But it isn't just this narrative. You know, I'm, I'm announcing something that's bigger than I can handle in one book. It's just, I think... It's it always was... helpful for a career in book writing. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know whether, whether I should turn it back to you now. Uh, that was an impromptu summary of 350 pages. Do it, why don't we, before we get to judge, why don't you, you've got... One, the book has a lot of setting up the big argument, but then has some case studies of a right. few... Why don't you give us, give us Bitcoin? Well, that, oh yeah, Bitcoin is an interesting phenomenon to me. Uh, first of all, I'm not going to make past judgment on Bitcoin as the new money. Uh, it's rubbish. It, <laughs> well, uh, but, but the Self rubbish may yield something. You know, it's, it it, do. They, they do have some interesting theories. Uh, but, but, I'm, but I'm interested in why it took the world by storm. Uh, everywhere I go, people ask about Bitcoin, and they seem to show emotion. I, I, you know, I, I key into this when I'm giving my lecture to my students, uh, and I mention Bitcoin. I see them waking up <laughs> in the back of the room, <laughs> and there's a person has a certain gleam in their eye when they uh, are somehow really interested in a topic, uh, and so some people are better at judging what's going on in other people's minds. Uh, um, our president, Donald Trump, is remarkably adept at knowing when a story is resonant. And uh, he's a genius at that, I think. At that. And Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, Boris Johnson, where are you going to rate him on the genius? Uh, I, I, I think he has the similar genius. He knows how to, be a, uh, uh, how to start a narrative. And that's, that tends to, uh, yeah, influential people tend to often get that way uh, from... Uh, now, in the arts and literature, narratives are the defining element. Even music, I think, typically has a narrative attached, attached to it. Uh, uh, and uh, people will uh, write a song, say, and it, it will go viral. Uh, this isn't even just with the computers, it's long ago. And nobody can quite pin down what it is about that song. Uh, you can go to music school and they don't teach you how to do that. And you've, if you've done it once, you may not be able to do it again. So I'm thinking it's that kind of creative spark for a narrative, either positive or negative, that is a significant driver of our economy. Uh, and things, big things have, they have repercussions. So this l little narratives about immigration that we hear uh, have taken off all over the world. The other thing is there's worldwide contagion nowadays because we have communications that are so well developed. And uh, you have people in newspapers around the world reading foreign newspapers and judging these stories. Is this a story that I could transform into our local economy by changing the name, finding some, a similar example? Uh, narratives thrive on human interest. 
uh, personalities. They like uh, celebrities, but they'll take somebody who is not a celebrity, like Joe the plumber, uh, who we asked, what was it, uh, uh, President Obama, a question at one of his things. Uh, he's suddenly famous because the question, I don't even remember what the question was. Um, but um, It wasn't about plumbing. <laughs> they also get forgotten. That's part of the story. That unless, unless they are reinforced, they, they fade away. So some big events that we see are due to forgetting. So I think some of the populist movements that we see around the world now are, could be attributed to the forgetting of World War II. World War II was such a nightmare. Uh, everyone agreed to not be nationalistic for a while, not be racist for a while. But as the memory fades, uh, these old tendencies come back, unfortunately. Uh, and it uh, facilitates the revival of old narratives that were uh, uh, unacceptable before. Great. Well, on that very depressing uh, <laughs> note, yeah, so basically, Darshini, most of it is your fault. It's um, all my fault. Over to you to defend yourself, Thank you your profession, so your life. Much. Yes, thanks, Dawson. Uh, why did I ever say yes? I could have stayed on a holiday and read the book on the beach. Um, yeah. uh, having, I got an advanced copy, unlike you two, by the sounds of it, and I can confirm exactly what you're saying, Robert, which is that, frankly, this is no one-hit wonder. You've created something here which is going to run and run. It's going to take a lot of managing this. Um, head over the road. Um, you don't have to look outside the pub, look a little bit further on. We're all told that democracy is broken, that our political system is in chaos, and uh, we don't want to know what's going on out there right now. But on the other hand, you know, economists have clung to this idea that uh, we're above all of that because we're in possession of the facts, the expertise. We can explain exactly what is going on and what this all means. And actually, all of us journalists as well felt that we were slightly above all of this because we too could hold people to account, we could analyse, we could report, we could lay bare what's going on. And then I read Robert's book. And frankly, I discovered exactly what Torsten said, which is that um, economics is broken and so too is journalism. Uh, so frankly, we might as well just give up and go home. But I should have felt really depressed when I read the book, but I didn't. I actually felt really energised, which is very hard at the beginning of a new academic year in September, of course. But I was very energised because he suddenly looked at it and went, yeah, this makes sense. This makes sense. And, um, you know, as an economist, I started my career more years ago than I'd like to think. But one of my first jobs was back um, working for a firm of economic consultants who, as such firms do, got commissioned by uh, the brewing industry to write a uh, report on the importance of that particular sector to the UK economy. I think it was probably a precursor to a budget submission. And, um, you know, our team scratched their heads trying to get up a, an equation, a model that would, would, you know, talk about consumption of beer in the UK and what affected it. And it just wouldn't fit. It just wouldn't fit. And then I went into the room with our team and I said, have you thought of the fact and they were all 40-something men, they're not actually incorporating women in any of these equations. And they looked at me and went, but women don't drink beer. At which point I had to explain to them that it was the 90s, yeah, it was a long time ago, and that ladism, remember that, that, you know, back in the day, back when, you know, a pound would fetch you a lot more than $1.20, was all the rage and women were drinking beer. That sort of changed the equation, but that was a narrative that had escaped their notion. Once, you know. So that really, you know, back then, I'd noticed, and this is sometime after you started talking about the 20s and the rest of it, but it was quite clear that economists were only talking to each other and that our assumptions and our way of thinking had to change. So it was lovely to see that put into words all these years later. Um, it's a really, really important book because you talk obviously about um, what narratives are, what a good narrative looks like, how they form, how they spread, and the impact. And in many ways, you know, some of the ideas you talk about aren't anything new. We've all had ideas that these things have been around, you know, buy rumour, sell on fact. Um, also, this idea in the media, we have some sense of responsibility. Um, when we talk about, for example, a downturn, we're very careful nowadays not to, for example, have a graphic with an arrow going like that. Because guess what? It makes people think, oh God, the economy's in crisis and they stop spending and we start having those self-perpetuating recessions. And the BBC had a massive down arrow all the way through the financial crisis. We've talked a lot about that. It was since. massive. I wasn't there at the time. Okay, if I'm just saying it was really big. Yeah. It, was, it was very big. We have talked about it. They have learnt. Okay. We've got one that goes no, up the whole time. They go up even when it says downturn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to talk ourselves into a boom. Okay. But uh, that's for the future. Fine. Let's see. 
But it's, I find it really fascinating when you talk in the book about, you know, what actually makes for a good narrative. And you're right, it's, it's all about those sort of personalised stories. But also that kind of detail. Uh, for example, we talk about the Laffer curve, and, and for anyone who's not familiar with the particular curve, although it's had a bit of a resurgence under the current US president, it's this idea that you can cut tax rates and yet get more revenue in because of the fact that you're incentivising people and businesses to become more productive and more prosperous. Um, and this whole idea that in the 70s, Arthur Laffer, the, the then economist, apparently sketched this on the back of a napkin. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realise when I read your book that in actual fact, this may not be true. But that's what's he made this. I remember it, doing that <laughs> when and, uh, it was there. You see, the restaurant itself says that they doesn't actually, didn't actually have paper napkins. <laughs> well, right. And he said, I wouldn't write in a cloth napkin, which well, to me was a revelation. Right? Yes. Which is another reason why you shouldn't listen to the theory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, you can't even remember that. I mean, this guy. Keep going. Yeah, so you know, destroy that on the back of that new narrative there. Uh, which may got me to thinking about how this might apply in our economy today. For example, when we talk about that infamous bus during the referendum campaign, and had we not had a bus with millions of pounds written on it talking about the NHS, would we still be talking about it now? And would Boris have had to talk about making models out of, what was it, painted, painted cartons? Or what was it to try and get this idea of the NHS bus off the top Google spot when you Googled Boris and bus and Brexit? Um, so... It, it really brought home to me how important this is and the fact that, you know, it's a very nuanced art. But it throws up a lot of questions. I mean, this is the problem with your book, Robert. Is it's, it's a fascinating read, but it throws up a lot of agonising questions for economists, for policymakers, and frankly, for journalists too. Uh, because, as you say, the big question is how do these things spread and how long do they evolve for? And how do we go about predicting which narratives will take hold and how the impact will be. And it may not always be the impact we imagine. Um, back in May 2016, a long, long time ago, back when uh, I believe a pound of which you $1.50 back in those old days, a gentleman called George Osborne was uh, running the shop over the road, Treasury of uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. He warned us that in the event of Brexit, we could see house prices falling by 18%. Remember this? Or they could take an 18% hit, 18% lower than they would otherwise be. Uh, some people said Project Fear. Journalists up and down the country duly reported this. We did think that perhaps this might pe make people think twice about voting out. Actually, when we look back after the referendum, and hindsight is an amazing thing, we found that in actual fact, the way that people up and down the country looked at it was, I can't afford a house right now. An 18% drop in house prices or 18% foregone in a house price rise may actually mean that I do stand a chance on getting on, moving up that housing ladder. This may not be a bad idea. Now, we know in hindsight that, frankly, this 18% of house prices may not be true. But that narrative took hold, right? And it influenced behaviour. So in retrospect, when we look at that, I wish you'd written this book some years ago, frankly, because we may have had a better guide to what was actually going on and how to interpret it. Having said that, as you say, it's not an exact science. Exactly how these narratives That's form. Alfred Marshall. <laughs> he said a quote from yeah. over a hundred years ago. Mm. But don't give him the credit for it. <laughs> don't give him the credit for the idea. It's, 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 it's all yours. <laughs> Alfred Marshall's not in the room. Um, but, you know, uh, some of the things you talk about I find fascinating and I think are open to all sorts of different interpretation. For example, uh, I'm going to mention Bitcoin as well. I'm going to call it crypto assets because I don't believe that they are currencies because uh, I share some of your concerns about them. Uh, you talk about the fact that some of the interests propelled the swings in its value might be propelled by people who are fearing becoming obsolete. You know, perhaps they are going to be replaced by machines. I found that a really intriguing theory because when you look at the kind of people who are buying these assets and, you know, I like you, whenever I do an event and I start talking about cryptocurrency, suddenly the room wakes up and those are very comfy chairs and people probably are having a nap. So if you mention Bitcoin every three minutes, I think we'll be OK. Um, but it is interesting when you look at the kind of people whose jobs are most at risk for obsolescence. They're not necessarily those who are investing in these kind of assets. So how does that hold true? So I think this throws up all sorts of questions. Um, for economists, you know, I, I left the profession a few years ago, and frankly, I don't envy them now, because I think you're right, the models are broken. 
uh, we've scratched around, as you said yourself, this idea of a um, benevolent dictator who implements specific plans to maximise social welfare doesn't exist. And yet we are selfish, we don't behave in rational ways. Are economists ready to actually change their models? When you look at what independent economists um, up and down the country are predicting over the next year or two, over the next five years, there's a remarkably narrow spread, ultimately, of outcomes there. And that's because we're all relying on these very safe, outdated models. But how do you change your models? How do you do that and make those actually? I mean, that to me is a big yeah. question. First of all, I think that it's not as bad as you are making out. When I was president of the AEA, we got like 5,000 paper proposals and I had to sort through and organize our annual meeting. And I found lots of papers that were interesting. It seems to me that we're, uh, a lot of people in economics would agree with what you're saying themselves. They want to see the profession changing, and it already is changing. Uh, so I'm coming to the defense of these other <laughs> economists here. But it, it's, there, there was a fad in economics uh, that started uh, over 50 years ago towards math econ mm. and theory. And they would debate such things as the proof of the existence and uniqueness of general equilibrium, uh, which was very abstract. And whether if we have lexicographic preferences, do we have a unique <laughs> equilibrium? Uh, actually, those are kind of nice things to, uh, to read, but they didn't, uh, they didn't lead to any breakthroughs in economic policy. They're, they're too abstract. And I think the profession is, uh, the is coming back from that. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and, and they have this new plaything now, which is uh, voluminous data uh, about companies and individuals and governments, uh, and they're starting to uh, uh, use natural language processing. And, uh, uh, and that has been an evolution, which the, I think you know, is... And the same thing is happening in other... Departments are always changing through... I think the unfortunate thing is to divide people up too much. It's good to have uh, events that bring people together from different uh, different disciplines. Now, before we have a, a structured discussion, is there anything else you want to add? I, I, I was, you're I you're busy like damning us all, but they were some, obviously. Well, I was going to come clean now and, okay. and basically damn myself as, an, as a journalist. Okay, fine, go on. And say this, you know, frankly, coming out of this, I didn't feel particularly good as, in terms of being a journalist because it it taught it basically brought home to me a, a lot of what had been sort of rumbling around a lot of our minds, which is, um, you know, the idea of fake news and, and our role in this and right. spreading it, in, in, in mitigating it, in, in squashing it. But, um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting when you talk about, when we talked earlier about the president and his narrative and how successful that has been in some ways and, and how that may be set for a change. But... Um, Back in 2015, I worked in a, in a um, Westminster newsroom, um, not for the BBC, for, a, for another organisation, um, before the BBC comes in for too much um, time for this one. Uh, and we just thought, they're very entertaining. I worked on an evening programme. We thought, oh, great, you know, presidential election's coming up. There's this reality show guy called Trump, and he keeps doing these rallies, and they're hugely entertaining. Viewers seem to love them. We should put them on. They're just hilarious, aren't they? Because it makes no sense, which we did time after time after time. And I can't remember any other candidate getting that kind of coverage. And if we were doing it, what were they doing in the state? And were we part of this machine? Were we actually perpetuating that narrative for him? It made me think in all sorts of ways about our responsibilities there. And then again, another thing we talked about a little bit earlier, and I said to you, how do we go about stopping the spread of fake news? And, um, and I come from this from a very personal point of view in the sense that, as you say, I work for a, a, an early morning radio programme and quite often we have people come on and make all sorts of claims. Now, if Torsten comes on in the morning and says to me... Those are the good days, yeah? Those are the great days, yes. And I see Torsten in the green room at, at 6am and he comes in and he says to me, don't panic, the sky has turned green. Mm -hmm. And I just sit there and I go, oh, I've come in at four in the morning... Uh, if it's pitch dark, then I have no idea if you're telling the truth. You know, I've not been up. Maybe it has turned green. I have no idea on the spot. I can go, are you sure about this? And he goes, yeah, 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 it's fine. I've just come in, the sky's turned green. Um, and then that perpetuates, and, and the sky has apparently turned green on the, on the airwaves. And half an hour later, I can trot out and find out that actually the sky wasn't green at all. By that point, as you made the point to me, it's too late. 
that narrative has perpetuated. Anyone who hasn't stuck their head outside the window believes the sky is green, and we have to blame Torsten for that, but there is little comeback from that. So it's, it's a big warning about the dangers of narratives, but also it taught me the, fact, the idea that, like you're talking about economists actually making more of the data that's out there, we need to do the same as journalists, and we need to collude more with other science as well. And it's not enough for me to say, I'm an economic journalist, I need to go and talk to economists. It needs to go wider than that. So I'm really curious, as you say, you've created something here that the rest of us now have to take on and apply in practice. Well, I'm glad you view it that way. <laughs> Should we, um, let's, let's cover four issues and then get some questions from the audience. So let's cover the substance of kind of, to get to the meat of like where you, what we take away from this, to give you, and then a bit on what it means for economists and economics, and then briefly let's do a kind of bit of past and future. So on, on the substance for a second, okay? So stories really matter. Narratives drive things and they spread like diseases in some fashions. Now, but in terms of what that actually means, let's just cover a few issues. So what is your, what is your view on the relationship between reality and narratives? So how much in the end, even if they diverge temporarily from reality, must they come back to reality at some point? Yeah. Well, fortunately, humans are capable of rising above the go viral narrative. And we do live in a society where there is trust for example, we do have this vaccine, anti-vaccine movement, but it's a limited, right? It's, uh, most people will get vaccinated. Due to not being idiots. <laughs> well, I, well is, is that part of the problem? Again, we are assuming that... It's, not, be, it's not a question of being an idiot. The, uh, the, the anti-viral people, some of them write well, and they give arguments, uh, and they, they have conspiracy theories that the medical profession is in a conspiracy to make money selling you dangerous vaccines. Yeah. That, it, it's not, uh, I, you and I don't believe it, but it's Just kind of things. subtle. How do we know that there isn't a conspiracy? Uh, you, if intelligent people do believe these things. Oh, and it's a lack of trust. Uh, it, got me back to you, you go all depressing again, but you're being optimistic that we get back to reality at some point, but when their kids die. Uh, I, I, we, we somewhat get back, it's a mixed world, we somewhat get back to reality. There are certain kinds of things, I could ask for directions uh, to, an, uh, to Parliament on anybody in the street and I would expect I'd get the right answer. That's unambiguous. But lots of stories that matter, but Keynes talked about this in his 1936 book uh, that launched Keynesian economics that he, he has a famous chapter 12 on the long-term expectations, that business decisions typically rely on expectations for the future. If you're building a factory, will there be demand for it? Will there be competitors We're going to come back in? to that in a second. We're going to get some canes on the screen. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that nobody can... We, we, in the decisions that are important, we're all making a gamble. Nobody can tell what... Uh, and the animal spirits are the willingness. Uh, Boris, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Boris, I was going to say Yeltsin. B Boris Johnson <laughs> uh, is an ad adventurous, and he's taking risks right now based on a hunch of how it will come out. Yeah. And an adventure, he has animal spirits, give him credit for that. <laughs> they may have been dimmed over the past uh, 24 hours. I mean, but, yeah, but, the, um, <laughs> but I'll give you an example. So, Bitcoin, okay? Yeah. So you do a really good, you help tell the story of how the Bitcoin narrative developed, spreads the component parts, why white men are particularly susceptible to it. The, um, uh, the, but as a, you know, one more reading of Bitcoin over the last decade is that narrative has an effect. Uh, the price rises significantly and in the end reality returns and people lose a lot of money. Uh, I think that is a likely end. This has happened many times before, but it always seems different this time. So uh, the uh, Bitcoin story, uh, it's, you probably know some mathematically inclined people who would actually read uh, the algorithm. You can find it online, Satoshi Nakamoto's paper uh, from, uh, was it 2008? Uh, and then it will direct you to other readings. Uh, it's impressive. There's math in that. And so uh, the story is impressive. And it doesn't seem like another in the long line of speculative bubbles. And of course, Satoshi Nakamoto himself, or herself, yeah. I mean, yeah, that we don't know who in it itself is. has been part of that 
facing that. Now. So it's a mystery story that no one has ever met Satoshi Nakamoto. They, they, they met him online. This is what the new world we live in. And then he decided to disappear, or whatever, she decided to disappear. But that only, in, that only enhances the story. Now this sounds crazy, but that's the world we live in. These people are not insane, but they have to bear in mind that they're hearing about Bitcoin because of the quality of the story. And it's an appealing story that maybe that's the true genius of Satoshi Nakamoto is to concoct a story and then stay hidden for years. Uh, and it keeps people wondering. Uh, it's a high quality thriller. Yeah, now I'd, I'd like to mention the RSA algorithm, which was published in some math journal uh, half a century ago, which is the first uh, public key, pri private key cryptography. Uh, I looked up how many newspaper articles were written about the RSA algorithm. I think it was about 25 That's quite a lot. in all of history. All right, that was 50 years of writing. It's like one every other year. Okay, that's the key to that sort of cryptography is the key to the Bitcoin. How many articles about Bitcoin? I got something like 12,000. So it's everywhere. And uh, why is it a better story? Uh, if you have to be mathematically inclined, I guess, to appreciate the RSA algorithm. And it's kind of, I can't even remember. I did try reading it, but I can't. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, but it makes it into an impressive, cool story. People like uh, cool stories, and they, they like to uh, get involved with the Bitcoin story because they feel it rubs off on if, and it, it's so easy to get into Bitcoin. You just get online and you buy it with your credit card, and now you're a part of the avant-garde. It's unbelievable. If you want to give away money, it's very easy to do. <laughs> yeah, well. Now, the, what about so some of the things we're talking about here? A lot of the stories, are t you're being careful to say, like, oh, it's not all negative. But the idea of talking about stories as viruses and some of the examples, which are kind of things causing large recessions or people losing lots of money in Bitcoin, is it? Is it when do we get the, is it ever positive? Is it ever good to have these narratives? Well, maybe it is in the sense that it inspires people to work on computer science. People move into fields. They're, they're, here people are very faddish, I think, in terms of young people choosing a college major or a, a, something to go into and then movies and stories. Uh, we've seen a lot of books that favor uh, high-tech entrepreneurs. Uh, Steve Jobs was a huge bestseller. The book Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson was a huge bestseller. And if you look at that book, it portrays Steve Jobs as having some human spirit, some spirit of creativity, and that he could look at all these engineers and see right through what they were doing and see an opportunity there that they couldn't see. Uh, so that becomes your role model. And you buy Bitcoin because you think I'm sort of getting into that. You, you want to be involved, uh, and it, it, it's, it enhances the narrative and it causes it to spread further. What about let's just do let's do economists then? Okay, so like, what do what do economists take away from? They read your book, they're really interested, and they're like, you know, they've got a mixture of existential angst, but they're kind of learned some of these lessons. And then, so one way of thinking about this is the. It's clear that the story and the narratives that are driving economic events are clearly very useful for people in understanding the past. Okay? So they're clearly, for economic historians, it's very right. clear to see the relevance. Understanding what happened in the 20s and the 30s is very hard without thinking about this kind of story. Right. Thinking about, th you know, even things that happened more recently, it can clearly add to our understanding. How much can it help people trying to understand the future? Well, okay, so right now we're talking about a new global recession. And it comes, these things come up, and I'm not prepared to give a confident forecast about that. Uh, but I, I, I think maybe uh, we can improve our forecast of these, and we might also improve, improve policy. But I'm thinking, looking at the talk about the new recession, that it, uh, it seems to have aspects of a self-fulfilling prophecy. That, uh, that was a term invented by Robert K. Merton in the 1940s, just after the Depression, and he was using it to describe the Depression. People were afraid because they thought other people were afraid. And the same thing is happening. There has been so much attention to this uh, inverted yield curve as a leading indicator. 
uh, and I wondered, uh, is that really, right, or is this just data mining in the sense that somebody noticed the, a, the, somebody noticed the inverted yield curve preceded a recession, and then started to talk it up. With every recession, I looked at, I did a count of the term inverted yield curve. With every recession in recent decades, it gets stronger. There's more talk about it because the evidence <laughs> seems to be building up that it's good. But I think that it might be reverse causality. That now, you, when people think there's a recession coming, they pull back their expenditures. So now it's getting well, rather really intense. Actually, because you know, inverted yield curve, as you say, there's, yeah. there's the evidence in the US particular that it precedes a recession, right? Uh, less so in the UK, I believe. Uh, but you know, more recently, we've been angsting at, at the BBCs, how do we explain this inverted yield curve? It's very important people know. But right. is it important people know? Because as you say, if it's the kind of evidence, the kind of news that causes people to alter their behavior away from the markets, yeah then surely that is not a good thing. So yeah, so they start, uh, uh, they start pulling out of the stock market, putting more mo trying to put more money into uh, the bond market, but it causes prices to adjust. So it's the story having an effect on the economy. This is where economists have been uh, not adequately uh, involved in trying to understand this phenomenon. But we understand, just to push back a little bit, so it's not new to say people will respond in herds, people will listen to a story. And Herd then behavior is an that's, old, that, yeah. yeah. that's definitely an old idea, including in economics. I think what's new about yours is, is the, the, you have a, a combination of optimism that the new availability of data will help us take these insights and to improve our understanding, not just of what we can see happening in the past, but might be happening in the future. Yeah. Well, but while being quite open that this is really hard. And there's, quite, there's a tension in that within the book. I, th I think though that uh, if there is enough scholarly research on narrative economics, there will be a better understanding of the past, and we'll be more sure of ourselves, and we'll be less uh, hesitant to describe narratives as causes. I think we can get onto it. So now, of course, this might attenuate the business cycle if uh, if we understand it better and understand it. So you're not worried about level of optimism outrunning, you know, we've, we find it quite hard to do quite a lot of things in economics. You're not worried you're setting us up for a fall. If we get this, yeah. so we'll be, now then we'll be doing really good economics. Yeah, um, well it's hard to know. It's, it's like, uh, is, is research in artificial intelligence a good thing? Uh, as we get more and more of this, what will our quality of life be? The other thing is whether recessions are even a bad thing. There, there's an argument, they talk about cleansing recessions. It, uh, f weak companies fail in recession times and new companies come up. So um, maybe it's not all bad. Also, in That's not a very popular narrative. No, it's not a popular narrative. <laughs> I, I, unemployed, is that known? I, I'm not proposing okay. that, okay. but I'm saying that insights like that about the quality of life in different narrative regimes yeah might uh, be, offer useful insights. A sort of the adjust and modernize kind of model. Um, I mean, I'm intrigued because, you know, a lot of what we've talked about is the fact that economists, frankly, kind of get that people aren't rational, but have never known what to do about that. But what you're saying is there's now ways, particularly if we tap into this wide availability of data, to try and kind of understand what these people who aren't rational, how that's evolved, and how that might be impacting on things. I mean, that, that's to me is the big takeaway from this. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I like to counsel that uh, narratives that are influential are not necessarily great literature or great stories, uh, not necessarily interesting to you. Uh, they're just, uh, just uh, contagious. It may be because you can insert them into conversation. There, there's many hooks that would in a typical human conversation, you have to be polite and listen to the other person's story when you're itching to tell your story. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's just easier to type, to get some stories going than others. Uh, I'm not saying I have the answer to this, but mysteriously, some narratives, uh, I find the Justin Bieber narrative puzzling personally, <laughs> but I'm not in that group. <laughs> what, is, what is the Justin Bieber narrative? Is this a popular culture reference? 
Uh, there's so many Justin uh, Bieber. Do you know who but Justin Bieber is? I was being joking. I, was joking. <laughs> okay. I mean, tangentially, I vaguely know who he is. <laughs> there's some youth in the office upstairs. The um, working, not locked in. The one, but the, <laughs> now, the, um, let's just do let's just do economist for a second. One last yeah. economist question, right? So, the um, so one thing from the book is you set out this thing. There's these like dodgy narratives going around. Some are, may or may not be good, but some are definitely bad. Can cause problems. The journalists are doing their best, but are kind of out of control. The economist. What's interesting is you're not you personally again. Thanks. Uh, the um, your you can be worried about that. Your view about economists' role in that world is quite. Um, is it, I don't know really how it sounds pejorative, but it's the analysis of the narratives and understanding of them. It is not what is quite fashionable in bits of the economics profession now, which is agency in creating the narratives. So what are you referring to? Uh, so so you, you, are, you, you want economists to analyse narratives about the economy, right. to understand how that shapes actual economic events, but you don't go as far as saying, and, therefore, and when you understand all that, economists should be helping to shape to get the right narratives, so that's the economist's job. Uh, I, well, I think it is, if you are an advisor to the Prime Minister, that it, it, it's already known to be the job, right? I mean, you, you have to okay, not inspire economist. needless panic with something you say. They know that already, but it's not from their graduate school education that they know that. It's just common sense, common knowledge. But I, I think we can inform them better, so they'll do that kind of thing better. Now, let's do two tough questions. First one is, which you basically did before me, but I'll give it, which is, this is a quote, if I can make this thing work, or whoever's at the back can flick it on. Have I broken your thing again? There you go, right. This is a very short and totally kind of cut down version of some of what yeah, we were right. referring to earlier. Okay, so, right. so Keynes, but this is just one example. This is Keynes in the 30s, but there's lots of other, both his writings and other people even before, which are basically getting at versions of economic outcomes are not just shaped by rational humans taking rational right, numerical right. decisions. They're based on animal spirits. We've known that for ages, um, and we haven't, it didn't, we still had the kind of rationalist expansion, the 50 year detour into very technical math, some of which is useful, some of which is not. Despite knowing that, are we sure we're not gonna think this now, but it won't actually change anything we do? Well, I think people are changing what they're doing already. Um, there's probably someone in this room who's done narrative <laughs> studies, and in in, I'm just guessing. <clears throat> um, but there will always be a tendency for faddishness in academia. Um, maybe we can, uh, there, are, there are efforts to create the more uh, inclusive community where you bring people together uh, uh, from different disciplines. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I don't know, the future will, I, th I think professions do respond. There's an optimism take. You're optimistic. Well, maybe, uh, again, this is animal spirits. I could be pessimistic too, but I, I feel optimistic. You're currently, you've currently got an optimistic narrative about the economics profession. I even like the mathematical economics at some level. So I'm not, I'm not uh, saying we shouldn't do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's literally, that's literally all we do, so it's a serious problem. I mean, the, the, right, last one. So now from, from the like 1930s to today, so this is showing you a chart, which I can vaguely try to remember in my head. Right. It starts in 86. It starts in 86. Let's not start in 86, because we haven't got time. Let's just start on the right-hand side of the chart. So to explain to uh, you guys, the blue line is showing you GDP per capita growth across that time period. The red line is showing you economic sentiment. So people were asked that how, how optimistic do they feel about the economy in the year ahead? So how do you think it will go well or badly for the economy in the year ahead? The red line. And the dotted yellow line is the same question, but instead of asking them their view of the economy as a whole, it says your and your family's financial situation. Okay. Now, I want to highlight one thing oops, sorry, about this narrative issue, which is so the economic news on TV, lots of it, as lots of leavers will tell you, is quite grim. Okay. Yeah, we are the Grim Reapers, basically. You are basically Grim Reapers. It's quite grim. Okay. It's the only way they let us on TV and radio, by the way, if we have a... Yeah. Yeah. So, this line, everybody's quite pessimistic post the referendum, the line's been falling consistently. But... This, this is just UK. This is just the UK. Yeah, because you haven't had a Brexit referendum, because you can't. <laughs> All right. You're fine. <laughs> You've got other issues. You could join the EU. Slightly racist president and others, but this one you have not got. 
<laughs> well, we we're, have we're unique in this world. We have secessionists. I have about. secessionists, but I don't. It's not. You know, it's yeah, harder. It's, it's harder big. constitutionally to happen. You <laughs> haven't got Article Fifty. Right. <laughs> right. The, um, uh, the but the top line has not moved down at all. So people's confidence about their own financial situation, their family, has not come down at all since the referendum. Uh, but their view about the economy as a whole has come down. What is going on narrative-wise in Brexit Britain? Uh, okay, I can only guess. I'll just give you a <laughs> so guess. That's fine. This is, it's not fun uh, if you it, don't guess. There have been other results that show that most people think that their own boss is a nice person and that my job ultimately is... This is common. Uh, I did a s survey about this opinion. They think that he's a decent guy and I'm, th this is a healthy oh. work situation and I'm working to fulfill my obligation and I, th this is normal and he's not going to fire me until it happens. They, they, they uh, tend to think that. Uh, and they read these stories. It, you know, you, I live in a little town in England and it seems to me like it's, it's normal here and I can't imagine this happening. But they might imagine all kinds of apocalyptic things happening to the whole country. There's sort of a little bit of moral superiority to my group that I feel. Well, I'm doing fine. And we'll be all right. Yeah, not just doing fine, but we're a community or uh, something. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is because it does matter. Because if you, look at, if you look at what's happened to... So incomes in Britain have been squeezed since the Brexit referendum. We had higher inflation, lower wage growth but it has not fed through into lower consumption. So people cut their savings and carried on spending. They cut them a bit, but they carried on spending disproportionately. Yeah. And when I try and think about why is that the case, okay? Like my wages are down, but my weekly shop is not. This helps you kind of think about that. Because if you, if you believe my personal situation is not going to deteriorate, then I think, well, it feels a bit tough today, but I'll smooth mm -hmm. through that and I'll be okay tomorrow. They, um, but I do think it is, the gap is very large. Like, it's very large. It might be an error, too. That's my second what? theory. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> ben? Fake survey. <laughs> but the person responsible is over there, so you can, you can take... <laughs> now, what, about, what do you think is going on? Well, I, Brexit think really Britain. I think this is really fascinating, because obviously, in the aftermath of the referendum, we were... T I mean, I say we, journalists, economists, were told, aha, you told us awful things were going to happen if we left the EU. Um, of course, we didn't leave the EU the day after the referendum, but that's, you know, those details get glossed over in people's minds. Um, it hasn't happened. What we do know has happened, obviously, is that the economy may not have grown by as much as we would have expected in the absence of the referendum and what followed. We do know that business investment has been hit. We do know to some extent that exports have been hit. And also, as you're saying, real wages haven't really done what we'd hoped they'd do. But people say, ah, oh, you, you sold us this lie, Project Fear. That is what you told us to expect. That's what we're thinking would have happened. But actually, when I look at my, my wage slip, it's not as bad as you told me it was going to be. They don't seem to realise it could have been... Record better. employment. Record employment. Higher wage growth in the US. Wage, yeah. um, and therefore, that's going to be... That, that my situation's OK. So you get this disconnect. And it's really interesting because that kind of says to me, do we need to change the way we communicate with people as well? That when we say to them, look, you know, if this happens, if this kind of disruption happens, if, if you know, we leave the EU, there will be some disruption perhaps, um, and that could influence the path of the economy. Do we need to tell them in a different way? Because I think what people took away from those kind of messages is, oh, God, we should brace for that. When in actual fact, that has been my lived experience. Right. Let's get your um, questions, or if you've got your own answer to Brexit Britain and all that, that'd be great. Uh, how many mics have we got? That's an issue for me. Okay, well, let's start with the gentleman here at the front for me, then. Oh, no. Becky's here as well. Uh, we'll, go, we'll, go, we'll cover the front. Oh, there's a gentleman next to you, actually. We'll go there. Go ahead, sir. Give us your name. Um, I'm Andrew Silverman, and I work in, um, in uh, public affairs consultancy. Um, I'm very interested in the whole issue of narrative, because ult ultimately, it, it, what comes down to when I studied macroeconomic years ago is what the real economy is. And I think one of the things that we haven't spoken about is what the real economy is. So we're very focused on London, we're very focused on what's going on in Parliament, but it's what real actors are doing in the real economy, cutting away from social media and, and influencers, and how people are actually responding to economic circumstances now in communities across the UK, and I'm really interested in, in both our panellists' views on that. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Philip Ward. Uh, Professor Schill in his book refers to a study published last year that shows that false stories are much more likely to be retweeted than real ones. So I really had two questions. One is, is there any study that shows that at some point there is a moment of reckoning that, that, that people sort of suddenly bang their heads and think, oh my God, I've been led up the garden path. And, and the second one is, does that mean that when one is trying to convey a true message, such as what was discussed just now in relation to the Brexit referendum, uh, one should actually go out of one's way to make it sound false so that it's more likely to succeed? <laughs> Right. The, um, uh, the, and we'll take the lady here and then we'll go back. Thank you. Nushin Argun. How can the economists keep uh, news media in straight and narrow in terms of positive stories? There's, quite, there's a tr tendency in economics land to believe that there is some kind of world where the media gets controlled by the economists. I've noticed it spreading. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Anyway, yeah, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure, apart from you personally. Yeah. Anyway, right, okay, so we've got a range here. Uh, are we sure that the narrative problem isn't that people are not really focused on the real economy and they're talking about bits that aren't really important to most people? Uh, should we, people with true stories, make them false to get some retweets? Moral dilemma. The, um, uh, and do we let the economists run the BBC? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, you... Uh you were saying, do they ever wise up? Yes. Uh, I can give examples of that. The thing that comes to mind most dramatically is the Me Too movement that we just saw, where people uh, lost their reputations catastrophically because of a new narrative about the women who were afraid to speak up, and now they're speaking up, turning out that it's been a total collapse of some men's reputation. Another example that comes to my mind uh, I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, Eugene, uh, Joseph McCarthy was a U.S. senator who was anti-communist. And he started telling wild stories uh, that many prominent people were actually communists. And when he carried that too far, he was then censured by the uh, U.S. Senate. And uh, he just disappeared. He was gone. Um, Father Coughlin was a minister in the United States who had a radio show with millions of followers. And then he came out for Adolf Hitler, and that did it. He disappeared. That was the end of his career. Uh, so there are examples of sudden changes like that, but maybe that's kind of, uh, kind of rare. Um, now, uh, you were saying, how do we control the... Pra I, I don't... Uh, uh, <laughs> Influence, yeah, yeah. That's an influence maybe, is a I think maybe, inf yeah, maybe uh, something that prohibits some of their activities of, of targeting stories on vulnerable people. Uh, and uh, there, could be, there could be some accountability for facts. But we, uh, the government shouldn't be in the role of, uh, did you say leadership or governing or... Uh, uh, yeah. You said influence. That's the word that uh, I think uh, I wouldn't use that word. Uh, I would uh, use uh, it has to be subtle. We've already for many years had laws against libel. If a, universe, if a newspaper publishes uh, fabricated stories that ruin someone, they, they are breaking the law. Mm -hmm. So we do have something like that. So maybe uh, laws regarding the press could still be improved. I don't... Uh, Real economy. You all, you, yeah. People are focusing on their stories. All they care about is London, the city of London, insert New York City into here. Yeah. The stories don't focus on the real world, so you miss what's really going on. Yeah, I think that that's... Joe the Plumber. Yeah, that's Joe the Plumber. Uh, and there, there's... When, when people come to London, they're kind of dazzled by it, I think, right? And you see all these foreigners walking down the streets. And you uh, think that's the UK, right? You just think that's... That's the new UK. And uh, uh, maybe we do uh, have to show some more... You know, I, I'm thinking of my own relatives. I have Trump supporters. And I, I have the suspicion... They're nice people. <laughs> They're perfectly <laughs> rational people. 
but I have a sense that they're kind of in, they're, they're not as successful maybe uh, of our, of our, among our family, and that maybe there's some identity issue that I, I've I've tried to be more kind in speaking to them. <laughs> I mean, it helps us on camera. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. odds of them watching it, low, but if they are, damage high. <laughs> like, nobody tweet that. <laughs> uh, right, let's get some more questions. There, um, and then Darshini, you can come in. Gentleman at the front here. Oh, we've got a rash at the back as well. Let's take the two gentlemen at the back here. Go ahead, sir. Hi, William Claxton Smith. I have a question about language in narratives. I don't think there's anything you think about, but the use and misuse of language in narratives. In particular, I was thinking about the misuse of the word investment, which we heard. Mm -hmm. used to talk about speculation in the context of bit, Bitcoin, but really I was more referring to every time anyone suggests spending our money or government spending our money, it's investing that money. They, they'd spending. like to say that, yeah. Right, let's get to the back and then let's get a lady over here as well, Becky. Hand up. Um, no, thanks for your talk. Uh, isn't one of the problems with something like economics, uh, something I, I would explain it maybe as garbage in, garbage out, in terms of students and exams, um, there was a story, for example, a Apple announced about a year ago that they were selling less handsets because people were holding on to their existing models and they weren't upgrading to the new Apple model, etc. And maybe that could be an indication of a recession. Why not put a question like that on an exam paper? Why is that? Could that be a, a recession? And the smart students would start looking at it, think, think, think about things like eBay and, and the prices of second-hand Apple phones, etc. And you could also you know, bring in part of it about economic curves that I don't understand enough about. But if you don't ask questions like that on an exam paper, you're just going to get more theoretical economists, possibly. I think that's a plug for letting you write lots of exam papers. But we'll <laughs> and there was a gentleman right in front. Um, Chris Rosbach. Uh, just a question, if the problem that is leading us into all of this is the stories, then what is the solution? Is it more stories or is it facts? Great, and let's get, there's a lady here. I, you have to write these. I'll write them all down, don't worry. <laughs> the, um, we'll just, uh, they won't be repeated back to you accurately, but there will be questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, Bridget Devine, um, you present uh, your narratives theory as almost um, a potential... Um, alternative to kind of like mathematical economic modeling. And I was wondering if you think there's a place for no. mathematically modeling a narrative. Uh, you have like um, your, your virus curve. Right. Um, is there a way that we could mathematically model this thing? Okay, that's great. Right, Darshini, why don't you go to you um, first on, I think the first question on language use, misuse. What do you do when someone comes on the radio and says <laughs> stuff, uses language that isn't about the sky's green? Obviously, I would never say. No, no, and I'm sorry about that one. I, I, I wouldn't tell them the but truth. When someone who's actually... not the Resolution Foundation comes on and says something naughty, what are you thinking? What do you do? What do you do? When well, you know they've you know they've misused language in front of you. Well, the, the language point is a really interesting one because I agree with you about the investment term. Um, and then when we talk about investment, we think about things that are going to create for the future. And I think you call speculation on the one hand. And as you say, when we hear the government talking about um, investing our money. Now, what they're actually doing is they're borrowing to put into quite often the areas they'd like to prioritise and expecting us to pay that money back in the long term. That ain't to me investing, so we need to think of another way of describing it. And also, that's your job for tomorrow because you're going to be covering that spending round. So I'll, I'll, I'm, going to, I'm going to delegate that one to you. But this comes also back to that earlier question, if I may, about, about economists taking control of the BBC. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here horribly. Um, but you're right, there, there does need to be more positive economic news out there. But there's a few issues here. First, that, and I've said this before uh, uh, openly, that a lot of newsrooms, I mean, A, time and space is limited. Um, news, um, economics is often say, seen as something fairly dry and fairly dull, but it's something they've got to do. And where do editors feel like they've got to do it? They feel like they've got to warn us about what's coming down the line. So um, I often use, they often say to me, oh, let's stop covering. Um, various bits of data because everyone's bored about hearing the same story. You know, employment at a record high, great, we've heard it before. Um, but on the other hand, I say to them, well, what happens if we don't tell people about what's going on in the economy and then suddenly we present them with the next Northern Rock? And they say to us, you never told us this was coming. 
which is why we're much more ready to kind of come up with the red flags and sort of say, look, you need to pay attention to this. And also audiences pay more attention to it. That, I'm afraid, is a sad fact of the matter. The other issue is that government, for example, going back to what I was saying about investment, they're very keen to come on and tell us their line, their preferred line is, you know, we want you to talk about the fact we're investing all this money or we've created all this jobs. They haven't created all the jobs. Um, they're not investing their money, it's, it's our money. So quite often when you have to kind of pick apart those stories and dissect them, um, you do come out sounding pretty negative and cynical. And I'm, I'm afraid that is just the way it goes when you're holding these people to account, uh, which is really frustrating. I mean, unfortunately, Torsten gets a great job. He gets to come on and do the positive stuff. Perky smiling. The perky smiley stuff. Right. And, and, yeah. On that note. So on the, I think the fruity language was garbage in, garbage out. The, um, anyone that did economics is not garbage in this thing, but the what about just should we be putting more narrative into undergraduate economics education? Well, one thing that's happened with undergraduate education, at least in the United States, is that there's a decline of attention to economic history yeah. as well as the history of economic thought. Uh, so it's not thought of as a place to get a good job. The graduate students uh, are particularly interested in getting a good job afterwards. And they may be making a mistake in their choice of field. I was saying that narratives affect choice of occupation more generally, that people flock to occupations that have good narratives. Um, and they may be making a... a do, you, do you think when economic historians read your book, they're just going to scream silently into the night? I did of ask course. my old graduate school professor uh, of economic history. How he, annoying is this? He, I sent him this draft of this book. And he said, very nice, but I wish you could get more economics in it. <laughs> okay, well, they, um, so you can't keep some people happy. They, um, right, what about, um, is the, uh, what's the answer, Chris? I think, it's, which I think Chris is a really good question from the whole book, like what is your answer? How do, uh, My an <laughs> well, this will sound very academic. We need more research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that definitely is. Uh, but also- The world's burning. But what also we, we just need- more paper. Just reading my book will help policymakers, I think. They it's already know that they should have bailed out Northern Rock immediately, and they did it. But they did it with some hesitation because that's not canonical economic theory. That's true. I was in the Treasury at the time. We were, to politely put it, shitting ourselves <laughs> <laughs> about nationalizing it. We didn't want to do that. Unfortunately, Richard Branson doesn't like actually paying for things. He was yeah. the alternative bidder and he wanted it for free. The, um, what about more facts? You can tell us about that as well. More facts, will that help? Oh, that was your... Yeah, he's like, his, his, his suggested answer is, would more facts help? Absolutely, I think. Uh, it's, uh, but there, there, there is a movement, uh, there is some education, that's another uh, field of study, about how to present facts to your students that make them more appealing and interesting. And there is a school of thought that you have to build them into narratives that students will remember better. Uh, so that's the object of an educator. Now one thing that we have in the 21st century and the 20th century is universal publication, in, in uh, 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 universal education in advanced countries. That, that's what makes democracy work. You, you, you can't have universal suffrage and not have universal education. Uh, and you need educators that make it, uh, make it uh, rem memorable for their students. And to some extent, that w we are doing that already. Um, the thing that's changed in the 21st century is we've l lost trust in these institutions. And that's a, a real problem. Would more facts help you? Is the more gap facts. in your life not enough facts? Yes, it always, always more, more facts can always help. Um, uh, I started my career at the BBC at the start of the millennium. I left, I came back, I was, I was away for a decade. One of the biggest differences I've noticed since coming back, a lot of things, I mean, you know, coffee's got better and the canteen's still the same, but we do have a head of statistics and a team of statisticians on staff which, you know, I cannot tell you what a difference that's made in terms of the fact that it's a clear sign that the media is taking facts more seriously and specialism more seriously and that it's not enough just to get away with regurgitating press releases and the rest of it. And that, of course, is how narratives spread in the media. 
um, because boy oh boy, some of the press releases we get. Not the ones from the Resolution Foundation, obviously. No. no. I'm slightly worried by some of the tone here, but the, right, and the last question, which is basically, so you're, pay attention to narratives, people, but you're enough of an economist for life that you've kind of had the numbers yeah. read into you and you're trying to ride both horses. Can they be integrated? Yeah, I talk about this in my book, but I moved it to an appendix at the end because I didn't want to scare off readers. So we know it's not a novel, it's got an appendix. But I actually say in the appendix that I think some uh, merging of narrative epidemiological models with the existing models, uh, such as the Keynesian model, we have two kinds of feedback. One is narrative feedback, contagion feedback, and the other is the conventional Keynesian multiple rounds of expenditure. Keynes was actually, uh, I, I, I call him a narrative economist because he, uh, he listened to, his most remarkable book was not his 1936 book, it was his 19, I guess it was 19, book called uh, Economic Consequences of the Peace. So if you remember at the Versailles Treaty after World War I, uh, he was part of the UK contingent to the uh, treaty. And he resigned and left and wrote this book saying that the treaty was going to be too harsh on the Germans who were in many senses victims in this war just as we were. And he, he essentially predicted World War II. He didn't say it like that, but there were words in there that this is going to be deeply resented. So he was really talking about not creating a, a, a narrative that blamed the German people for World War I. And I think then as World War II approached and the uh, people uh, respected him and listened to him for that reason. But he didn't need maths in his models for his narrative story, did he? He, just told, he didn't he just do that. In his, even in his general theory, he didn't, but not um, maybe in footnotes, I don't remember any equation. But then it was uh, uh, Sir John Hicks who wrote his famous 1939 paper on the ISLM model, which was a mathematization of Keynes. So Keynes had a mathematical model, in, in, but he didn't want to write it into his major treatise in life. It was already quite long. So. But he did uh, spin the good yarn. That's good enough. Okay. okay, look, the, um, one of the facts is that we're three minutes over uh, finishing time. So can we all thank our panelists for giving us their stories and insights tonight? <laughs> uh, indeed. Go out, enjoy your stories for the evening because the facts are tomorrow is going to be chaos. <laughs> <laughs>